All right, uh, so we are going to look at uh, distributed databases uh, systems and of course uh, concurrency control. Uh, the concept of concurrency controls uh, comes uh, with respect to the challenges that we can always um, encounter when actually uh, doing some kind of transactions uh, within the distributed databases, right? So the, uh, again, we need to understand uh, maybe the various characteristics uh, that we looked at uh, when we, we were looking at the uh, various characteristics of, uh, of distributed systems. Yeah. Now, those particular characteristics, we can always uh, find them when you are talking about distributed databases. Uh, when you have a centralized system or centralized databases, that means we can always access data from one central point or uh, location. Uh, but again, uh, the concept of distributed databases, that means we need to map or replicate various databases across uh, multiple sites, right? And that is why we need to have the urgency and understanding of how we can have the concurrency control uh, with respect to maybe accessing data from different sites without having some kind of uh, challenges. Right, so we are going to look at the uh, various uh, characteristics of distributed databases, why we need this particular databases, and of course the challenges that you can always uh, have. Yeah, so we are going to say what actually the fundamentals uh, of what makes this particular distributed databases work uh, according to our plan. Uh, we also have the various distributed database systems that we're going to look at. We have already mentioned this, uh, heterogeneous, uh, we have also the homogeneous kind of databases that can be implemented across these particular uh, distributed database systems. Uh, the major part of us is to understand how we can uh, actually have the concurrency control and uh, for a better part understand how we can do some kind of recovery uh, using the right protocols. Now. Again, we need to understand the client server architecture because we can't really talk about distributed database uh, systems without uh, understanding how the client uh, server architecture works. So I think at this particular point, we should be in a position to really demonstrate uh, the concept of uh, client server architecture because that is actually the building blocks of how the distributed databases uh, functions. So we have uh, different categories of concepts that we need to understand as far as distributed database is concerned. Yeah. So what are the nitty gritties? Yeah. Uh, first, we have the database. Uh, we need to understand what a database is. Of course, we know what a database is. Uh, we already explained how distributed database concept actually uh, is applied. Now, for communication to happen in this uh, between these different or amongst these uh, different uh, distributed databases, uh, we need to understand the concept of network because we have to have network so that we can link or actually join the various databases. Right? Uh, we also need to understand how a database actually function. So we need to understand that uh, for us to have a database, of course, we need to have a management system. Right? So we have different categories of database uh, management systems uh, that can always ha help us uh, interact with the various uh, databases. But also most importantly is to understand how the various processes interact in what we call a transaction. Yeah? So uh, if we or a user interacts with a particular database, the instance of that interaction we can always uh, term it as a transaction being executed. So when you do those transactions across multiple uh, databases or distributed databases, uh, we can have uh, multiple networked compu uh, computers. So we're going to look at the concept of heterogeneous and homogeneous. Yeah. So what is a distributed database? Yeah. Uh, so we can say it's a collection of multiple uh, logically related databases distributed over a computer network. So there must be some kind of uh, communication link uh, for us to have this kind of distributed databases. Now, uh, remember also that we talked about the other uh, formalities, such as the uh, distributed operating systems that this particular uh, database sits on, right? So I think maybe I'm, I'm going to mention that as we look at uh, the heterogeneous concepts. Now, 
We also have the distributed database management systems, which are softwares that manages distributed data across the network, yeah, which makes this particular uh, conversation or transactions transparent uh, to the multiple users that interact with these particular uh, databases. So again, the characteristics of distributed systems comes into perspective. Transparency, yeah, openness, and so on. So we're going to see how transparency is managed across this particular uh, databases. So, so uh, there's a diagram here that maybe can quickly engage us into understanding how this uh, concept of distributed database is very essential. So uh, you can see we have three uh, states here. I think uh, uh, these states uh, sorry for that. So there's London, New York, Hong Kong and for us to understand the concept of distributed databases is that London, there's a payroll app and this, and also there's a kind of, uh, this payroll app kind of consists of uh, uh, some kind of employee information. So there's a, a database known as uh, the M, the M, yeah. So that means, and there's also the internet. So that means there's some kind of network that links these different states, right. Now, what we need to understand here is that uh, if we have one centralized, because this seems that all these other New York, Hong Kong, uh, these particular apps, all must link to one centralized uh, database, which is situated within the London, right? Which is not really a good thing, yeah? And that's what distributed database seek to solve, yeah? Because if a user within the New York uh, or within New York tries to access uh, employee information it's a bit uh, okay with the time frame yeah uh, maybe uh, the response time uh, is going to not be really uh, efficient and also maybe there's some kind of uh, communication link barrier yeah so there's a lot of uh, cons that can be uh, realized in this particular uh, concept right so you can see there's some kind of um, slow slowness in accessing uh, data. Uh, again, we have this other diagram that now shows the same database, uh, but now it is replicated across these multiple states. So that means the user within New York doesn't have really uh, to uh, waste a lot of time or spend uh, or waste a lot of time uh, transacting some information from the London database. So it is now close to uh, the user. Yeah. So we're going to see this availability is now increased, maybe because of communication link failure. Yeah, we can eradicate that. Yeah. Also, we have reliability. Yeah. Uh, whereby maybe uh, they can always access the information. Yeah. Without any other additional changes. Now, this issue or this kind of um, a concept where we replicate or have different parts of the database across multiple uh, sites. Yeah is actually what we refer to as replication. I think I've already used that. So we can always replicate either the whole database across multiple sites or some parts of the database across multiple sites. And that's now the concept of what? Uh, uh, that's the concept of distribution. And also, uh, further to understand this, we also can fragment, yeah, uh, like, uh, I believe we understand how database is actually developed and designed. Uh, we all, always have the relationships between different uh, entities, right? So we can also fragment the very small granulity or the very small uh, attributes of this particular database so that they can be replicated across also these different sites. So maybe going forward we are going to understand uh, this particular concept of fragmentation and replication because I think these are the two uh, major terms that always uh, are associated with the distributed uh, databases because we are aware that any form, uh, form, formation of a distributed system we must have some kind of data being accessed and where are these particular data stored are stored within some kind of databases. So it's very, very important. And that's why we have the concept whereby uh, you can always access maybe some information yeah, 
uh, very very fast when you log into maybe the internet yeah maybe when you're interacting with a particular app yeah so you can always get that particular information courtesy of the distributed uh, database a uh, concept right uh, so with all this understanding maybe we can uh, and uh, further understand what uh, is expected. We are going to look at the additional characteristics such as uh, executing transactions in parallel, as you can see this particular diagram. Yeah? So a particular database allows multiple users to transact or to uh, have different transactions simultaneously within a given what? Uh, databases without having challenges. Of course there are challenges. That's why we need to understand also the concurrency uh, control. Yeah. Uh, with respect to maybe which transaction, uh, what happens to a particular transaction when the, there's a failure and so on, right? So, uh, talking about uh, the various features of distributed database system, I've mentioned about transparency and you have different categories of transparency uh, based on what or the kind of engagement we have with this kind of database uh, system. We can talk about location transparency, uh, we can talk about name transparency, yeah? And in all these transparencies, all we need to understand is that there must be some kind of openness, yeah? whereby the underlying framework or the underlying architecture, actually, really, the user is not concerned with all these kind of underlying framework. So, ad one advantage is uh, the transparency, and we can say that this refers to the physical placement of data files or relations, which is known to the user. So, uh, this kind of transparency allows people to access database or data from different locations without really bothering what where this particular data is stored is it running on oracle is it running with mysql sql server so on and so forth right so there's a picture here depicting this kind of scenario so you can see there's some kind of uh, uh, levels of transparency yeah so we can have multiple replication of data in different sites as i mentioned also, we can fragment data in different sites, as I uh, already mentioned. So, uh, transparency can be emulated by looking at uh, the previous concept where we had the payroll or the employee uh, data uh, database in one uh, of those particular uh, states. Yeah? So, we are assuming uh, we have some kind of a uni a universe of discourse here. We are assuming that this particular uh, employee data employees associated with a particular project or worked on a particular project yeah, and some kind of information. But that is not our business because we, we don't really, really need to understand what database is. We want to understand what distribution factor is within a database. So uh, this particular diagram further showcases the concept of fragmentation. Yeah. So as you can see, for example, uh, let's look at the San Francisco state. Uh, we can see that we have the uh, we have the the part of that particular database, yeah. And also, if you look at Chicago headquarters, you can see that all the parts are associated. Now, in this concept of distributed database, we normally have we can uh, refer to Chicago headquarters as a primary site, yeah, because it contains uh, maybe the latest uh, database state, yeah, that is going to be replicated at all the other. Uh, sites. So Francisco, Los Angeles and any other site is going to map their data or get their data from the primary site which is uh, Chicago. So the concept of rep uh, replication of data you can see we have the same same data replicated across multiple sites and further still the various data are fragmented. Yeah? Uh, we talk about different fragmentation styles where we can fragment the entire, uh, we can fragment the schema, which is actually the uh, the various columns of the database, yeah. Or we can still uh, fragment. Uh, when you talk about fragmenting the various columns of the database, we refer to vertical uh, fragmentation. I think I'm going. We are going to look at that, and of course we can look at horizontal fragmentation, where we now basically fragment. The various records, yeah, of a particular out, of a particular entity across multiple uh, across multiple sites. So I think um, we are going to discuss more about that. But the concept of transparency is achieved when we have uh, replicated data across by the concept of fragmentation, either horizontal.
either horizontal or uh, vertical. Again, we the other uh, as I mentioned the various uh, transparency we have different levels as you can see I mentioned about location transparency, yeah, which refers to freedom, yeah, of associating or actually executing some different transaction commands uh, from different locations without affecting how the entire operation uh, works. If you remember how we are, we look when you talk about, about characteristics of the various distributed databases. We mentioned about transparency, and we talked about transparency in detail. So I think if you can borrow a little from what we discussed, this one is now a walk in the park. Uh, we also have the naming transparency, uh, whereby with respect to any location that you are, yeah? Like for example, if for, uh, you created or you have, or you are associated with a particular bank in Nairobi, let's say, uh, okay, any bank for, for example, right? And you happen maybe to move to the village, you can still access the same same balance account or your account details from the nearest ATM. Yeah, so that that is a concept. Yeah, so it, it doesn't mean that when you are you are in Nairobi, when you visit a particular ATM, uh, it gives you your right name or your right information, and if you move to the village, it gives you a different information. Yeah, so the naming transparency actually is uh, put into consideration. Uh, of course. We also have, uh, as I mentioned, the location transparency. So it doesn't matter uh, where you are. You can always execute or retrieve your account balance. So uh, I've already mentioned these particular two terms, uh, replication and also fragmentation. So uh, we can always store multiple copies of data across multiple sites, as you have already seen in the previous diagram. Right. So this one comes with these advantages. Replication comes with these advantages and disadvantages. Remember, we talk about like failure in link or communication link. Yeah? So if one, for example, one site fails, that means that you can't be able to access your data. You can always be routed or the other site that is functioning can always give you your, your information. Yeah. So that is a, uh, maybe one advantage of replication. Yeah. Our, the other one is that it minimizes the access time. Remember our New York, when you are maybe in another state like London. Yeah. So you don't really need to do a, a multiple transactions uh, to New York. It can be replicated to your nearest uh, uh, database for that matter. Yeah. So it reduces that uh, access time. Right. Uh, of course, I've also mentioned the fragmentation. Uh, this fragmentation requires you to understand how the various uh, tuples. Tuples refers to the to the records, and of course we have also the the schemas or, or the uh, columns how they are arranged. So if you want to further uh, fragment or uh, distribute the finer uh, details of the database, we are supposed to have the fragments. Yeah. The, small bits of the data are replicated across the multiple uh, sites. So this one brings a lot of redundant data across the network, but of course we, uh, we, we need those particular redundant data so that if one, uh, if one uh, shadow of data or mirror of data fails, we can only always have another copy. So multiple copies or fragments is actually allowed in a distributed data uh, based system but there's always a mechanism of ensuring that we don't really have multiple but they can always be tied to the primary site under one single candidate key or primary key so that we avoid unnecessary replication of data yeah so that you don't really have multiple created accounts for example uh, across uh, the network but it can always uh, point to one single uh, data. Other advantages uh, that you can get from this particular uh, uh, concept of replication and distribution uh, fragmentation is the increased re uh, reliability. I think I've already mentioned that, uh, whereby uh, uh, it refers to system lifetime. That is, system is running efficiently most of the time. So we have talked about the failures, uh, time it takes to access a particular data across the network and so on. Availability, yeah, uh, we can always uh, continuously enjoy 
accessing our data at any given time, no matter the location uh, or time frame that you are using. So, uh, reliability and availability uh, goes in tandem with the concept of fragmentation and replication. Yeah, they're the ones that enables us to have this particular uh, concept of increased reliability and availability. So as you can see, distributed database uh, have multiple nodes so that if one uh, node fails, uh, there's another one that can always uh, stand up and uh, you can proceed with the transactions. Now, with all these, we can also have improved, improved performance. Yeah? So if the database is near you, for example, if, or if the data, not really the database, but if the data is near you, yeah, we can have improved performance. Remember, I gave an example whereby if the main office where you created, maybe for example, your bank details or your main bank uh, account where it was created is in Nairobi, yeah, it can always be replicated across the various areas and you can always uh, have them, right? So a distributed D, uh, DBMS uh, fragments the database to keep data closer to where it's needed most. So this reduces data management, like the access time, modification, and so on. Again, the concept of dis distributed uh, brings in the scalability uh, functionality, whereby we can always add uh, multiple uh, sites or multiple nodes yeah, uh, with the time. Yeah, so based on how maybe uh, we need to access those particular uh, data. And I think uh, other kind of uh, advantages such as openness of the various database management system softwares uh, is, can also contribute uh, to this kind of uh, implementation of distributed database system. So in, uh, we talk about the data storage where we store the data. Yeah? Uh, how do we replicate this information yeah, to all these particular uh, databases? So we need to understand that these distributed databases must or assume the relationship between the various data, uh, data concepts or, yeah, or data objects for that matter. Yeah. So you may need to have some related. That's why I said that you can't really replicate or you can't really fragment uh, the various data parts without uh, po uh, pointing them to a particular a common field which happens to be maybe a candidate key or a, a particular primary key. Uh, just allow her to use this. Watch her, could you? Huh? So, we have the replication uh, where the system intends multiple uh, copies of data. We have already seen that. And also we have fragmentation, yeah, uh, which actually allows us to further replicate yeah, the various parts of the database in what we refer to as uh, the tuples and the columns. Yeah, we can also do this, uh, we can also combine these two concepts where we have uh, replicated and fragmented data uh, at the same time. Now this concept of replication and fragment fragmentation uh, ladies and gentlemen, is actually what brings in uh, the distribution effect. Yeah, because you have to distribute the various parts of this data within the other, within the databases, right? So, as I mentioned, we can split or have the different parts of the database as horizontal fragmentation or vertical fragmentation. Horizontal fragmentation is where you have different uh, relationship. Yeah. So we can always fragment the tiny bits. Yeah. Now, uh, you understand that when you have, for example, a relational data model, yeah, we have a particular unique identifier which help us to have or create relationship uh, between the different uh, parts of the work, of the data. Yeah. So a relational data model actually assumes or help us to have this kind of fragmentation. So kindly note that. Yeah. So we also have the vertical fragmentation, which I refer to as having the split aspect within the columns or the schema. Yeah. 
so as you can say we need to have some kind of unique identifier it could be the candidate key we could have composite keys we could have a super key yeah just to reinforce the concept of what uh, the joint concept uh, so that we can always relate uh, the different data we need to understand that when you access like for example your account if you are in Nakuru for instance we need to relate it to the various data across the various sites yeah so that if maybe the centralized or the the primary site if it updates the various sites it updates it based on the primary key yeah so that we don't update the wrong uh, the wrong for example the wrong entities yeah or update the wrong information yeah? so that's why we need to have uh, this kind of uh, ids anyway to help you understand i think there's an example here like for example with the earlier consideration where we had the employee database yeah so we can have uh, like for example uh, uh, that uh, this particular employee being related to a particular department like for let, let's say department number five yeah so that one should be unique that is a concept yeah that this particular department five must be unique uh, across all the various fragments yeah so that we don't have a situation whereby uh, this particular department details is maybe replicated to a different uh, department uh, so uh, of course also we have the vertical fragmentation this is the example that i was using if for example you created your account with the name john sagimo yeah this particular name should be the same yeah we talk about vertical fragmentation of data yeah so that if john has been created even if john is accessed down in south africa it still remains john and not for example james yeah so the consistency or we talk about the consistent state of the database must always be maintained within the distribution uh, concept yeah so when you have a centralized system we can always be secure and safe and say oh i've already uh, i've already linked my uh, my various uh, relationships so i'm good to go but what happens if you start replicating and fragmenting the various parts of the database yeah so we need to ensure that all these and i think um, maybe later we're going to look at the concept of pushing or replicating data across the multiple uh, uh, sites uh, the advantage of that we have already seen yeah so vertical fragmentation is equivalent to having uh, the schema or the column modification whereas horizontal fragmentation is equivalent to uh, having a record or what we call a, we known as the a relation tuple a modification so we can also replicate uh, as i mentioned uh, data replication we've already seen that and of course we can also have the data allocation across the multiple sites upon request upon request means uh, during the uh, different transactions that uh, take place so in a nutshell a relation or fragment of a relation is replicated if it is stored redundantly in two or more sites so redundancy here is actually the concept yeah we can't have replicated data without some kind of uh, redundancy so replication as uh, we have as we have seen can happen in small parts of the database or it can have we can have full replication of the entire uh, database across multiple uh, sites so this one now help us to understand that the database distribution cannot work in isolation and that's why you need to understand the client architecture yeah we are going to look at maybe the the concept of heterogeneous yeah there are those particular founding for founding blocks or the building blocks for example that ensures that this particular distributed database function are normally yeah so you have multiple softwares hardwares and so on so in as much as we can be talking about distribute uh, distributed databases uh, we also need to talk about or understand the underlying framework or architecture that supports this kind of distributed uh, database 
otherwise our transactions are not going to really be very very fast enough right so advantages of replication as you have seen availability uh, the other concept is parallelism you have already seen uh, actually executing transactions in concurrent manner across multiple sites uh, we also have seen reduced data transfer rates this one comes with its challenges as, as we have seen it brings about the cost of increased updates take a, an example that with the one that you have seen yeah when one update happens across some kind of tuple it needs to be replicated yeah so it has to take time yeah so that we have the consistency yeah we don't want a situation whereby when you withdraw your balance in nairobi yeah uh, let's say you have a balance in your account of 50000 shillings yeah then you do some transaction you you maybe withdraw 10000 yeah so that means you have a balance of 40000 right and maybe when you go to a particular different location when you want to withdraw the balance still reads what uh, 50000 so that's not a good thing yeah so that means uh, the replication was not done properly yeah so we need to understand that so it becomes it comes with its own disadvantages and that's why a primary copy must be there that will always map and replicate this particular data across multiple fields yeah so uh, like for example you saw the headquarter uh, New York headquarter performing the prim the primary role of replicating or having the primary or the master data yeah so that if other sites malfunction or something happens uh, the primary site can always uh, initiate an, a, a fresh uh, transaction so so you can see the disadvantages of replication actually it is uh, it, it's somehow costly uh, in updating all these because uh, you need to have an, a nice uh, framework or architecture that is implemented talking about distributed databases uh, we have the homogeneous uh, databases uh, not databases per se uh, but the framework of, of homogeneity yeah whereby we have some kind of what a common underlying uh, system operating like for example we, uh, this particular diagram shows some kind of um, we might have of course different sites as you can see site one two three four right but in each and every site we have a common identical operating database management system they are replicated in all these particular what sites so you can see it is only oracle so that's the homogeneous yeah uh, concept of distributed databases so like a particular organization might decide that uh, all their systems yeah will always run uh, Oracle. Now this comes with its own advantage, right? It comes with its own advantage, right? Because there's a very extremely uh, high level of openness if we have one common operating system. Yeah, uh, it doesn't really take a lot of uh, steep learning curve for the different sites to replicate uh, data across uh, uh, themselves. So it takes a lot, uh, very few time to uh, really do or carry out some given. Uh, transactions right so that is it we need to have one a common database managing ma management system right uh, that really uh, resides on different architecture as you can see we have different uh, operating systems uh, they could be network operating system one is unix one is windows i think you understand this we really talked about the network operating system in our previous discussion so i think this one is home uh, another one is the heterogeneous yeah now maybe let's again look at the diagram here you can see now this time round uh, we have across the multiple sites we have totally different architectures uh, even the operating system themselves we have object oriented now we have relational we have hierarchical we can even have network yeah so these are different database management system implemented across a multiple uh, sites right so that is heterogeneous the concept of where databases are implemented in different uh, uh, database 
environment or actually architecture so we have like you can say we have uh, two examples uh, there are normally three anyway there are two examples here federated and multi databases now most distributed database systems employ the concept of federated systems why remember we talked about middle layer middle layer provide some kind of uh, uh, a common interface across multiple um, architectures that are implemented right so federated systems also uh, actually have that kind of concept whereby a user or any given program can always access data without really caring of the multiple uh, different systems that are actually implemented yeah so it engages on a centralized policy of data access yeah uh, by providing a common schema or interface yeah whereas multi database also is also heterogeneous in its form but it doesn't have one common interface of accessing data yeah so that means it is open yeah so multiple applications or users can be able to uh, have their own uh, view yeah separate views of how to access uh, of how to access uh, data within the databases so if you look at the structure of how we implement a particular relational uh, data model we normally have the various views like the internal view conceptual view ex and also external view right so that is what is replicated within the multi database system yeah, so you can have different set of what uh, views uh, it doesn't have really one common what uh, conceptual view or framework that uh, is used to access uh, data so the various distributed database uh, systems employs these um, two major concepts heterogeneous and homogeneous uh, for heterogeneous we have the federated and multi database so in nutshell homogeneous distributed database uh, all sites have identical software as you have seen oracle replicated across they appear to the users as a single system yeah each system or each site surrenders parts of is autonomy now here is whereby it creates some kind of openness autonomy means that they work separately but here all the system tries to make other system understand the kind of architecture or the kind of uh, maybe hardware or software that they uh, uh, they establish yeah uh, of course they are aware of each other and degree of cooperation in processing user requests uh, for the heterogeneous as you have seen the uh, different sites may use different schemas it comes with it's all also um, major problems as I already mentioned yeah so uh, when we are performing transactions uh, it could take time yeah because we have different layers or different uh, kind of uh, architectures that are linked together yeah so even some additional sites might not be aware of how other there's no actually a high level of openness in a way uh, maybe because of time I might have asked you to explain how we can counter this but we know that we have the distributed operating system yeah that really tries to uh, remove all these kind of what bottlenecks within the heterogeneous uh, concept yeah we have the middleware that brings everything uh, into a single uh, interface right so as you can see here we have uh, the database management system issues that uh, results from the federated we have already seen that like uh, differences in data models so they bring on board different data models uh, constraints yeah they have their own constraints I talk about the integrity constraints uh, the key constraints and even in languages the querying process yeah so there are, are a lot of uh, actually issues because uh, some sites might be running or using different database management uh, system or languages for that matter you will be aware that the SQL uh, they normally have different uh, uh, like for, for example how they implement their their data definition uh, languages and data manipulation languages they're a bit different yeah so this one 
uh, spirals to the federated systems. And that's why sometimes it becomes a little bit uh, hard to implement this particular heterogeneous. But it's the best, yeah? Because once we have the distributed operating system in place, once we have the middleware uh, in place, then we can uh, be rest assured that normal operation can always take place. Now, uh, talking about the underlying architecture of the distributed or any distributed system, we can't really uh, proceed without mentioning the client server. I think at this point, even uh, if you are not really interested in this topic of distributed systems, you should be in a position to understand how client server operates. Yeah? What is a client? We have already looked at various formations of client server, right? How the various processes interact. Yeah, we looked at the stub formation uh, when you're looking at the remote procedural calls. How, so I think uh, it goes without saying that we need this client server uh, database architecture still under the distribution of uh, databases. So I, I think I really don't need to explain more. But uh, maybe you could say that, uh, like, uh, I think there's no nothing to say here. But maybe let me focus specifically for on the, how the query takes place, right? Now, when we have replicated data across multiple sites, as you have seen, or better still, fragmented data, yeah? So if, for example, uh, the primary site wants to push or update the various sites with the correct information, yeah? So the, we say that the primary site could act as a server, for instance, yeah? So maybe when there's a link failure on the client side or when there's a, some kind of update issue, I think we are going to look, uh, we are going to look at the concurrency control techniques uh, just in a few and see how we can always uh, uh, handle this kind of concurrent issues uh, across multiple sites. So when this particular primary site tries to push or update the various uh, uh, sites, they offer or we use the, S, uh, the queries. Yeah? What is very important is that this particular query or the transaction that is carried out should be done uniformly across the various clients. Yeah? So at no any given time that client A has a different copy of data uh, as client maybe X, right? So uh, for example, client uh, passes a user query and composes into a number of independent subqueries which is sent appropriate. So each server processes its query and sends. So that is the common interaction, yeah? So that there's a back and forth kind of what? Uh, kind of uh, engagement between the client, yeah? So the primary site initiates uh, or normally responds to the request from the various multiple sites or the multiple databases that you have already seen. So this concept of client architecture, we are going to really see how it, how to manage the communication between the client and the server in what we refer to as concurrent uh, control. What happens, for example, when we have multiple clients requesting for a, for a particular resource from the server, yeah, and maybe there's no or a response or there's a failure or the update uh, anomaly has been experienced yeah so those are the common challenges that you can always get when you have clients and server uh, uh, communicating so one major problem as we have seen is managing concurrency yeah or the transactions or multiple transaction happening across the different uh, sites yeah so we need to understand the various concurrency control techniques that we need to employ uh, in a given uh, database distribution right so why or what is concurrency control yeah. now a concurrency control as you can see in database management system is a procedure of managing simultaneous operations without conflicting with each other right uh, I'll introduce this concept by looking at an example. Uh, for example, if you're a football lover and you happen to maybe want to book a seat, yeah, 
So maybe a particular person wants to book it online from maybe location X and maybe you are in location Y, right? So what happens? When you go to the system, both of you will want to book a particular seat. So when you engage the system, the system is going to show you that there's available seat, yeah? So you, in location Y, you're going to see that there's available seat, that there's only one available seat, yeah? The other person in location X also is going to be shown that there's only one available seat. So two of you are trying to book that particular one seat without knowing, yeah? So it happens that you execute concurrent transactions at the system, right? So how does, again, the system manage this request, two requests, yeah? So it will present you information, both of you, that there's available seat, yeah? Then you initiate the what? The payment or you book, yeah? So the cycle happens in that either both of you can do the transaction at the same time, yeah? which normally happens anyway, right? Yeah, so what happens if both of you book that particular one seat? Yeah, so those are some of the dilemmas or why we need to have this concurrency uh, control, right? So we have some protocols that are going to help us, yeah? Now, in a normal scenario, uh, like when that particular system presents uh, or show you that there's available seat, we say it presents the read all of you can read, yeah? You can always see that there's available seat. But when you engage further step into maybe booking or initiating the payment process, yeah? The concurrency or the control mechanism that you're going to see is going to only allow one to be able to write or actually to flash or to uh, execute the final operation. Yeah? So that is the understanding. That normally in any given distributed uh, system, there's a, normally millions of concurrent transactions that happens at the same time. That's why we need to really understand how do we manage this kind of what? A uh, concurrency. So uh, concurrent access is quite easy, uh, just reading. So, so that is it. Yeah? So there's always the read and write. So multiple users will always read uh, information within a database. But rarely will that particular database allow uh, multiple users to write, yeah? And what happens even if they write? Maybe that's what we need to understand. So potential problems that really happens uh, or occurs or within concurrency are lost updates, yeah? So this is when multiple transactions select the same row and update the row based on the value selected. So I think there are some kind of diagrams that I'll go use for you to uh, be able to understand. We also have the uncommitted dependency issues. We have looked at the fragmentation and the replication uh, concept, right? So if we have some kind of not fully transacted or the operations that are not fully uh, transacted, uh, then we can have the uncommitted issues. And of course, we have an unrepeated read. Yeah, maybe let's take a look using this particular diagram. So we have two transactions here. Yeah, that can help us understand the, temp the temporary update problem. <coughs> Sorry. So, in this example, if transaction one, for instance, you can see there's a read item. Uh, just based on the example that I was telling you, the read and write. So there's an X and uh, there's a read and write, for example, in transaction one and Y. Write is X and read is Y, right? So in this example, if transaction one for, uh, fails for some reason, Right? If transaction one fails for some reason, then X will revert back. Yeah, then X will revert back. That is the right. Yeah, uh, to its previous value. But transaction two has already read the incorrect value of X. So that's one common temporary update problem that we are likely to face uh, during concurrent uh, transaction. Yeah, so. This user in transaction one has already uh, performed the transaction. Maybe there's an invalid value, but it has already been passed to the second transaction. And the second transaction has already taken, or actually has already 
uh, executed the wrong value yeah but you can always roll back to the last uh, this is not a database class so i think i'm not going to go into details but that's why we normally have the roll back to the last uh, correct database um, state yeah the commit the last committed uh, database system so that's one uh, update problem that you can always uh, get one transaction uh, reading or getting a wrong value there's also the lost applet problem so in this example transaction one changes the value of x right it changes the value of x but it gets overwritten by the update done by transaction two on x yeah so therefore the update done by transaction one is lost yeah so i think it it is this is a very clear case in most of the time especially if the the tuples are not well fragmented yeah so you have updated yeah uh, uh, this one normally happens maybe when you have a, uh, some kind of uh, deadlock issues where they lock yeah so when one releases uh, the other one there is an update that is normally lost in the process yeah so this is a lost update problem that you can always have uh, within the distribution databases we also have unrepeated uh, read problem, uh, very, very uh, common. So in this example, once transaction two, for instance, uh, reads the variable x, our uh, write operation in transaction one changes the value of the variable x. Thus, when another read operation is performed by transaction two, it reads the new value of x, uh, which was updated uh, by transaction one. Yeah. So we can always have this particular repeated problem occurs when two or more read operations of the same transaction read different uh, values of the same uh, variable. These are just scenarios. Uh, I think there are more than that. Yeah. Uh, I think there's also the summary issue problem and so on. So ladies and gentlemen, what you need to understand here is that concurrency control is very, very vital. Yeah. So maybe we are going to look at these other scenarios in different arrangements and maybe see how we can correct or understand how we can correct these anomalies, right? Uh, just before we look at how to recover from these anomalies, uh, it's also important to understand that we have other additional issues that can reside within a particular distributed database. We have already looked at issues with the dealing with the multiple copies of data items. Uh, of course, failure of individual sites or links, right? And that is thanks to uh, replicated copies. Of course, we can always have some copies. Uh, we have also looked at the communication link failure. The other one that we are going to look at is distributed commit. Yeah, distributed commit. We are going to see uh, how this commit uh, is actually handled, right? Uh, we are also going to we are also need to look at the distributed deadlock. Uh, I think I've already met this kind of term yeah but maybe with respect to database we are going to understand how this happens right uh now when you talk about dealing with multiple copies of data this is a very strange thing i, I say that it also has uh the advantages and disadvantages yeah but we need to have some control of how this replication uh, happens so that when we we have uh, or we need to have recovery we know which kind of copies we need to know which uh, copies are to be uh, recovered uh, again we also have experienced failure of individual sites I think we have already seen this but because we have different uh, or multiple sites linked together we can always thwart that particular option a communication failure or link yeah, whereby one particular uh, link over the network is affected and this one can hinder uh, the concept of availability of the various data. A distributed commit. I've mentioned that this one, uh, we are going to look at it, how we are going to uh, handle it using the various protocol. Uh, but more specifically, we are going to look at it to how to use the two-phase uh, uh, option, yeah, uh, where we have the abort and commit option uh, also the distributed deadlock yeah no the problem with this uh, 
distribution is that we replicate the advantages and disadvantages across yeah so we can also have distributed deadlocks across uh, the various sites so how do we handle that uh, the generally also we have the system failure uh, that you can always experience uh, like loss of messages uh, we have already looked at this when two processes communicate yeah. we have seen the protocols under the trans transport layer uh, of course also how we can isolate uh, this kind of failures yeah so that summarizes the uh, other additional failures that you can have apart from just concurrency a failure we can also have those additional uh, failures now uh, going forward uh, we have I've been talking about transaction yeah and I said that this is a concept that allows us to understand how the various operations are executed uh, within a particular distributed system transaction is any activity done by the user yeah uh, it could be updating, withdrawing, and I mean, every this, all this kind of uh, stuff that in one way changes the state of the database at some given point. Yeah. So, what we need to understand, especially when you're doing transactions, we only have two options. We only have two options. And that's why I was giving you an example of uh, you with, uh, withdrawing some amount in Nairobi and maybe when you go to Nakuru you should have uh, the right balance yeah that means either you withdrew right or you did it we don't have any two or more than two ways when you're doing transaction within a database there's no intermediaries in short yeah? either you withdrew yeah, there's nothing like you, 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 you withdrew halfway. Yeah? There's always aborted. So if the transaction is not fully completed, yeah, maybe in the process of withdrawing, the ATM machine hanged, or uh, actually there's some kind of malfunction, yeah, it has to abort if the transaction was not fully done. Yeah? And that's why sometimes, uh, I think we have experienced this, yeah? Uh, if maybe there's some kind of intermediate internet connection when you're doing some kind of online banking then the system hangs so on your side it shows that you withdrew but you didn't get the money actually right uh, so it happens that you have to contact or go to the the headquarters of the physical uh, office so there the operators are going to look at the system and they are going to tell you actually it didn't succeed right so they can manually uh, restart the transaction or they can abort the transaction for you. But we normally have in an automated database uh, distributed system, we normally have uh, two, uh, two operations, either abortion or completion. No any other way. Anyway, uh, Transactions uh, happens in various ways. Yeah, we can have multiple transactions. We can have uh, single transactions. Yeah. So, how then does a particular system manage all these particular transactions? Because they happen concurrently. Yeah, across multiple uh, sites. So, transaction may uh, may access data at several uh, sites. Each site has a local transaction manager. So take note of that. So every site uh, has a particular transaction manager, right? Uh, this could be a server, for example, right? A local server, which is responsible for one, maintaining a log for recovery purposes, yeah? So the primary site will always contact the local or the other sites, yeah? and maybe update them on what has happened so that it gives or push the fresh uh, transaction. It also participates in uh, coordinating the concurrent execution of the transactions at a given site, right? So apart from manager, when you want to understand about transactions, also we have the coordinator, transaction coordinator. So it supplements or supports the role of what? The manager, yeah? So it plays the role of starting the execution of transaction yeah so it starts transaction yeah it replicates or distributes some transactions yeah to the various sites 
yeah? and it takes plays the roles of coordinating the entire transaction process either terminating it yeah or maybe escalating the problem uh, to other uh, links or other uh, databases that are functioning yeah so there's a lot that happens behind the scene but going forward take note of the tm the tc right so in this particular diagram you can see we have how the transaction system architecture is implemented yeah so the transaction coordinator is there uh, you can see there's also a transaction manager right now maybe one thing that is not captured here uh, when you look at further understanding of how transaction happens we have the participants yeah transaction p uh, tp transaction participants yeah maybe they are the ones that are, are captured in the middle where these particular arrows meet or at the center here yeah so for a successful transaction to happen we need to have the transaction manager yeah that oversees all the operations and the coordinator that coordinates the various transactions at the individual sites but also we have said that the transaction coordinator plays the roles of initiating the transaction that means it engages with the transaction participants i think we are going to look at that yeah so what is the purpose of concurrency uh, control now that you have seen all these uh, information of, or you have already understood all this information so concurrency control one uh, help us to enforce isolation yeah, through mutual execution exclusion among conflicting transactions yeah so we are going to see how this one is done using a particular protocol yeah it help us preserve the database consistent state yeah right uh, across multiple uh, executions of transactions it also help resolve read write and write write conflicts as you've already seen yeah so i think i've already given an example uh, and there's a, another example here uh, how the different transactions can be uh, executed and if there's an issue they can be rolled back and so on yeah so talking about uh, talking about uh, talking about the various uh, talking about the various uh, concurrency control protocols yeah we have already mentioned uh, that we have uh, the two phase uh, protocol yeah and we um, we are going to look at the log based protocols and also look at the how this can be escalated to the uh, two phase uh, locking uh, protocols <clears throat> of course we have the third the third phase uh, which is a bit complicated and it's beyond our the scope of our class uh, also we have the timestamp based protocol timestamp based protocols help resolve the deadlock issues yeah? and of course you have the validation that helps ensure that we have a successful uh, transaction so let's understand the lock based protocols uh, the concept of the lock based uh, protocol now when, to, when talk about the lock based protocols this is where a particular transaction or process is issued with a lock yeah uh, like here lock based protocols in database management system is a mechanism in which a transaction cannot read or write the data until it acquires an appropriate lock right so uh, every transaction has a particular transaction lock manager or what we refer to as the lock manager that issues the right lock to a given transaction let's revisit this the the example of our football lovers who are trying to uh, reserve a particular seat yeah so in each, in each and every so this particular protocol issues a lock it gives a lock to the different what uh, to the to, to, to the different users so this lock that it it, it issued was an uh, an s lock what we refer to as the shared lock shared lock is actually issued uh, to almost any transaction yeah because it really doesn't change or right change how the underlying data uh is right so the participating transaction is given an s lock and again if it has already completed that particular uh, transaction 
it unlocks it that particular lock is uh, uh, revoked so that means uh, maybe using the same same uh, example of the football lovers so that means the, the person who was given the right to book for that particular uh, seat was given an additional lock apart from the S lock yeah so the person the other person was given an exclusive lock the person who eventually uh, booked that particular seat was given what an exclusive uh, right or what we refer to as the X lock yeah so in a common transaction we normally have the S lock I think we are going to look at that and the X lock so this particular locks help manage the various concurrent transactions within a distributed databases yeah so it isolates various problems that you have already looked at yeah so a lock based protocols as you can see help to eliminate the concurrent uh, problem uh, concurrent uh, problem in DBMS for simultaneous yeah? so uh, these locks are kind of uh, parameters or criteria or some kind of data items data variables that are programmed to manage yeah? so how that is hap uh, that happens uh, is beyond our understanding but it's just, it's kind of an if statement that's normally written that if X or Y does this uh, within some this operation do this and that yeah so those are the locks they are just some set of uh, uh, instructions right so a lock requests are made to the concurrency control manager so of course we also have the concurrency control manager uh, transactions proceed once the lock request is granted so as I mentioned we have the shared lock yeah so as you can see the shared lock here um, it's also called the uh, read-only lock, yeah. So the users can be able only to read, yeah, and they don't really have the permission uh, to update the data in entirely. So there's a case there that you can always uh, take note of. So we'll consider a case where two transactions are reading, yeah. So uh, reading a particular balance, so the database will let them place a shared lock, yeah. So reading can always be associated with the S lock. But if you want to engage further in executing or actually uh, changing the state of the database, then the exclusive, uh, the exclusive, uh, the exclusive lock is normally issued. Yeah. So with the exclusive lock, a data item can be read as well as written. Yeah. So you have both the S and X as I mentioned. Yeah. So this is exclu exclusive and can't be held concurrently. So we have the two locks, the S lock and the X lock. Yeah. So when you perform the read uh, operation, uh, normally the protocol issues the S lock. When the particular transaction is to be executed or written, uh, the X lock takes uh, effect. So I really think you have understood that. So the two phase locking techniques, you have already looked at them. So the lock based uh, we have the two options so we can have permissions to read and again permission to write so lock for example is locked on behalf of the requesting transaction and of course you can also have the unlocking yeah which removes these permissions from the data item deadlock uh, maybe i've not mentioned it but we can always resolve deadlock by having these locks yeah so deadlock is achieved when you can't be able to unlock a particular operation yeah so it leaves those particular transaction in cycles without uh, allowing other transaction to be executed we also have unlock yeah so lock and unlock are atomic what do we uh, mean by atomic operations atomic atomic op operations means we can't do them or actually perform uh, them at the same time one has to uh, be done and then the other also needs to be done separate uh, two lock uh, modes we have shared I've already mentioned about that so I think I'll share the notes so that at least you need to look at that so conflict matrix happens within this so there's a transaction that can always be reading and writing and the one wants to write the other ones want to read write so we always have this kind of uh, back and forth yeah, concurrencies where transaction uh, happens so as i mentioned in every 
a lock operation you have the lock manager which manages all the locks right of data items now if you understand how the transaction is managed then it has to st the lock manager stores the information of a given transaction yeah like for example it has to uniquely identify which transaction is happening at a given time so it creates a kind of a, a table right or a, a particular database within it that keeps the records of the various transactions a typical transaction record has the transaction id as you can see it has the data item what is being actually uh, what kind of transaction or the data transaction the, which kind of data is being actually um, uh, being modified for that matter so that is the data item uh, of course which lock mode is given is it the read or the write yeah and then also we have the next data item yeah now if a particular lock table or lock manager doesn't have the way forward after a particular transaction has been finished yeah so you can see it points to the next yeah so it has to release that particular lock and lock it and after the transaction has been finished uh, successfully uh, it needs to push or uh, remove that lock so that it allows uh, for the next uh, operation so essentially or actually in summary a database requires that all transactions should be well formed what is a well formed uh, transaction a well formed transaction or a transaction is well formed if it must lock the data item before it reads or writes to it yeah it must lock otherwise if it allows all the operations or the transaction to happen at the same time we uh, will have multiple deadlocks yeah it must not lock an already locked data item and it must not try to unlock a free data item so those are some of the things that we need to understand with a properly well a constructed a transaction right so it, it ha must have some lock now talking about uh, deadlock there's an example here uh, we can see that there are two transactions happening transaction one transaction two and hey transaction one and two do not follow the two-phase policy whereby we have the s and the x so it happened that something went uh, wrong so deadlock here is established where when we have one particular transaction continuously waiting for another one to perf to finish a particular uh, operation and the other one also waits for the other one to so it's like they wait for each other yeah so that's a deadlock yeah so this deadlock can always be reversed or be handled by using the two phase lock technology that you've already looked at yeah that is prior to the deadlock after the deadlock also we can always have the commit aspect yeah where uh, we have the timestamp after some given period of time if the deadlock doesn't release uh, the operation or the transaction automatically it is forced to uh, do that so take note of the deadlock when two transactions are actually in a lock there is a cycle yeah so how do you prevent now uh, we can deal with the deadlock and also starvation now what is a starvation yeah as the name suggests starving this is a, a situation whereby a transaction or a particular operation needs to be executed but there's a one there's a lock in a particular transaction that doesn't really in a given way doesn't want to pave way yeah for other transactions to happen yeah so it starves yeah it starves uh the whole cycle yeah uh, like for example a good example is where by if you want to or there's an update that normally happens there's no um, a major update that normally happens within our a database yeah so we can categorize that as a major a transaction Suppose if there's some kind of minor updates that needs also to use that particular process that the major transaction is up, is using, yeah. So you will find that the major transaction will always starve, will not release the locks, yeah, for these minor transactions, 
So that's what we call starvation. Anyway, how do you prevent the deadlock? So a transaction locks all the data items it refers. So that one we've already seen how to use that. So you can always use the con conservative two-phase lock. Yeah, the read, uh, all right. Good, so starvation is a situation when a transaction needs to wait for an indefinite period of time uh, to acquire a particular a lock. Yeah, so it happens for a good reason anyway at some point. Because when you have a major transaction, actually, it should be given priority, right? But again, I will talk about maybe the major processes and the child processes. Yeah. So the child processes are normally starved, or the child transaction. Anyway, the salvation happens for these particular reasons. When waiting scheme for locked items is not properly managed, yeah. Uh, like you looked, we we talked about those particular update anomalies, yeah. Uh, maybe the resource has been leaked and other transactions happen to get the information and use them, like the major uh, uh, major transaction that I was talking about. And the same transaction is selected as a victim repeatedly. Yeah? You see, it victimizes. The major transactions victimizes the, the, the minor transactions. So it, do it doesn't release the locks for them. So deadlock refers to a specific situation. Mm -hmm. Processes are waiting. I think we have already mentioned locks and uh, deadlocks for quite a number of times. So we should be in a position. So it normally happens in a loop form. That is the circular chain. Uh, we can, after the deadlock has happened, we can resolve it by using the time stamp. Yeah, that's why I said that we can always use some kind of time frame, yeah, which is normally implemented using the time stamp. A locking aspect. I think we are not going to look at it because these are just many, many uh, concepts. Yeah. But take note: deadlock after it has happened, you can resolve it using a given time uh, time stamp. Uh, so a wait graph is created, yeah, so that if some time has been undertaken after before it can be able to do that, it automatically releases the lock. Uh, there are many variations of two phase. Uh, so I think we've already seen how to avoid this. Uh, maybe the last bullet here is what I was talking about. So there's a wound wait and wait die algorithms on the stamps to avoid deadlocks by rolling back the victims. So after some given uh, period of time. Yeah. Uh, also, how do we deal with this kind of starvation? Yeah. So we have said that starvation occurs when a particular transaction consistently waits or restarted and never gets a chance to proceed further. Yeah. Uh, in the last point, I've mentioned that in wound weight scheme, a younger transaction may always be wounded. Yeah, take note, a younger transaction may always be wounded or aborted by a long running older transaction, yeah, which may create starvation. Yeah, so this kind of uh, deadlock and starvation can uh, always uh, be handled by prioritizing which uh, kind of uh, transaction to be given uh, priority. So uh, we can also achieve. Uh, or remove this deadlock as I've mentioned uh, by creating some kind of time stamp. Yeah, so this is some kind of algorithm that's implemented within a distributed database system uh, when concurrency uh, takes shape. Yeah, so if there's a deadlock, it takes the time stamp based on the algorithm, it increments some kind of integer, and once a particular target is reached, maybe 10, the operation is aborted or something. Anyway, uh, furthermore, we need to understand how the various fragments, we talked about the various fragments of data. We can also have concurrency at the various uh, atomic aspects of a database. Uh, like for example, uh, talking about the various smaller components of data, we talk about granularity, yeah, understanding uh, the kind of relations that are there, understanding where this particular uh, data is stored, the disk block, understanding the records, the tuples, I mean, the finer details of a, a particular database. So we can dissect the database into various fragments and understand how to implement the concurrency, a control mechanism, or even how to remove the deadlocks. Because deadlocks cannot happen within uh, the entire table for uh, the, the entire database. It could be happening, maybe there are two tuples that are not really 
uh, talking to each other or that just a uh, some tiny process that are not uh, talking to each other so it's very very important to understand the various uh, finer details of this water of this particular database in what we refer to as uh, granularity locking so a lockable unit of data defines its granu granularity uh, as you can see we have the larger database normally referred to as the course and also the smaller finer details of the database as you can see this kind of hierarchy of granularity locking uh, the database uh, is at the top level then you can have the relationship uh, and also we can have the various uh, kind of um, smaller uh, records yeah so it's very important for us to understand how the structure of a database is implemented so that if there's some kind of deadlock we can pinpoint exactly where this deadlock happens or when where we have some kind of jam or of transaction uh, within this particular uh, database so that you can remove or handle this concurrency issues so again when you have granularity we can issue all the same same concept of the locks yeah but this time we bring the intention shared intention exclusive and also the shared intention we can have these two uh, happen in tandem the exclusive and also the what uh, the shared right so is indicates that a shared lock will be requested on some descendant nodes and also the exclusive it happens when we request on some descendant nodes and then the same happens when you have both uh, the locks now uh, we have been talking about the distributed commit. This is another problem that you can always uh, face uh, when you talk about the distributed databases. And uh, for us to really en ensure that we can handle this particular commit, distributed commit uh, problem, we need to also take a look at the commit protocols, right? Now, we have seen what transaction is all about how it can happen yeah when you talk about commit protocols or commit or atomicity of database or data we only to speak two languages either the transaction is fully committed or the transaction is aborted yeah so it's not acceptable to have a transaction committed at one side and aborted at the other so it's, we can always have only one way yeah it's either replicated across the entire site as committed or replicated across the entire sites as aborted. And to help us understand how this particular distributed commit aspect is implemented, we are going to look at the two-phase commit uh, process that is actually widely used. As I mentioned, we have the three-phase, but it's very complicated and it has a lot of uh, steep learning curve, which is not going to allow us to... Uh, uh, look at now distributed commit happens like for example there's this diagram here that shows the different databases for example you are assuming that the transaction t executes some kind of update yeah so you can see action uh, in one database is different from the second database and the third database which is not really a good thing and that's what we talk about as distributed commit uh, problem yeah we can't have a situation where the update only happens or we have different categories of data across multiple or different copies of data we have to have identical data across the various databases and that's why we say commit must be what atomic if you are doing some kind of transaction you can either commit or do uh, it should be performed successfully or in entirely uh, above be aborted right that's why we talk about the atomic of a particular uh, commit yeah so let's look at the solution and uh, specifically let's look at uh, both centralized and distributed uh, options so uh, let us go back to the terminology that you had already looked at you remember the transaction manager we can also uh, look at it as resource managers uh, we also looked at the participant I mentioned the participant and also here we have the coordinator the transaction uh, coordinator so resource managers as I said they are these kind of sophisticated database or servers yeah so what 
the participants yeah so the resource managers that did not that did work on behalf of transaction we can recall that the main or actually uh, the work of the coordinator is to initiate the transaction process yeah so it actually talks with the participants yeah to establish whether the transaction has been performed properly or the transaction is to be aborted and that's why these two um uh, these two uh, these three actually uh, terminologies are very very essential for us to understand how the uh, two phase is uh, happen like the two phase commit like for uh, why do we say two phase because we normally just have uh, the two sides yeah so phase one uh, you can see the, the work of the coordinator under phase one uh, the coordinator approaches the what the participants by preparing some kind of what requests yeah so these participants could be the client machines right so each participant votes yes or no so you can see it initiates the what the transaction yeah now what are these votes yes or no it could be the participants are telling my friend proceed with the transaction my link is up yeah there's no problem yeah there's no issue so i'll vote yes let the transaction proceed but maybe another uh, another client or participant could feel that no i'm not ready to have that particular update the client could do what or the participant could vote no so what happens in a scenario where there's a no vote within these participants automatically the abort is initiated right if the all the participants happen to vote yes then that the coordinator can now proceed with the, the transaction then that means the there's what there's a commit so coordinator inspects all the votes as you can see if all yes then it commits the transaction if there's a no in any of the participants even if there are five participants and there's a single no the abort takes effect so phase two coordinator sends commit or abort participants if commit each participant does something yeah so if it's commit either you accept the update or you do something and remember for some kind of transaction to happen we normally lock so each participant releases the locks uh, each participant sends an acknowledge back to the coordinator that either that particular transaction was successful or there was a bot so we can see the coordinator and the participant here so the coordinator initiates the conversation so it tells the participants is the link okay request to prepare the participant says yes i'm prepared right what the co does the commit uh, the coordinator do it, it commits so that is it and it's done the acknowledgement right so the coordinator and the participant ensures that there's successful transaction between them anyway everything will not go as planned so we can have a failure so again the coordinator starts uh, the conversation hey prepare what does the participant do no i'm not ready maybe the the network is busy the link is down the database has jammed so what does the coordinator do about yeah acknowledgement done so we can always have these two scenarios uh, either you commit a transaction in a distributed database system it's either committed or commit committed is another word commit or abort and that's what we refer to as atomic concept uh, when transaction happens so there's a diagram here uh, ladies and gentlemen you can see how the voting takes place so the coordinator says hey guys participants vote commit commit it proceeds so that is a successful uh, commit yeah so atomic commit is a form co that arises so you can see exactly what you've already seen we have already talked about yeah so a form of group of coordination that arises in the context of distributed databases so this is what happens that you have already seen there's a vote there's an input that is happen that is captured there's an output yeah in form of the commit or a bot yeah 
So the decision is either commit or abort. And again, uh, for the atomic commit one scenario, no two processes decide differently. That one we have taken home. It's either we are going this way or this way. Yeah. And uh, up to the last uh, atomic commit uh, concept where we have uh, if all failures are repaired and there are no more failures, then all processes will eventually uh, decide. So these are some of the, uh, ladies and gentlemen, these are some of the uh, concepts that we need to really understand uh, on how transaction uh, happens within the uh, distributed database system. Of course, we can say uh, also that there's a scenario here whereby one person or one client machine or one client database uh, decides my friend I'm not ready so you can say they are bought yeah and everything will be aborted so termination uh, happens all right so that's uh, how distributed database uh, system uh, uh, functions